My grandfather moved here in about 1968. He retired from being a farmer in the valley. And when he got here, he, you know, Asian Americans are really young, young at heart. He, he was so spry that he, he just drove everybody crazy because he needed to have something to do. So my father had just designed the hike and bike trail, the one that we, we know of today. And he was really good friends with the director of PARD. And the director of PARD, Alan went and asked the director of PARD if there was something that grandpa could do to keep him busy because he was kind of like driving us nuts. And the director actually said, yeah, Alan, you know, he can actually build a garden. Let me show you a couple of sites around town. They got in his car and they looked at three sites. And when they saw this one right here, grandpa said, this is it. And this was 1968, though. Austin was a lot different. There was really no skyline there, you know, and it was much quieter. But it turned out that this was the perfect spot. Wow. So Alan designed the uh, hike and bike trail uh -huh. we know of it today. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. That's amazing. Uh -huh. And then I was actually the architect for the Palmer Event Center oh, and, and the park, the Town Lake Park right there. So, yeah, so there's a lot of history. There's three generations. That's amazing. Okay, so Palmer, really? Okay, so that's good to know. Um, so what was his inspiration for the gardens that he ever said? Well, the main inspiration was that he just wanted something to do, okay? <laughs> but, but, the, but, but when he started building this, you know, Grandpa was a really... He was a real anti, because he was a son, an Issei, which is second generation. No, he was a Issei, first generation Japanese American. He had spent, you know, he spent time in Crystal City, incarcerated in Crystal City. And there he learned about the injustice, the social injustice of what was going on. So he actually, when he built this garden, he built it as a gift to the city of Austin for what it th did to our family. But then uh, there's also a message in the tea house that talks about, uh, about he, he was very, ag very against nuclear weapons because of what happened in Japan. Whether or not Japan was guilty or not, it was still not uh, the right thing to do. So this is actually a gift to the city. He didn't get paid anything here. In fact, he had to pay for most of the materials himself. And he did most of this work himself until the parks director came out here and, and brought Alan out here and said, hey, uh, uh, Grandpa's moving kind of slow on this. He's doing it by himself. What happens if he, something happens to him and it's unfinished? So the parks director got four people to help him from, the, uh, from PARD, and they, I think they finished it in like a year and a half or two. Wow. But before that, Grandpa would get up every morning, like I said in that video, and he'd cut, drive out here, you know, and do everything himself with his shovel and his crowbar. <laughs> <laughs> Basic, basically, yeah. yeah. So how large is it? Give us all the logistics. Uh, well, I'm not sure exactly how large it is, but uh, the, one, the one secret kind of is that if you, if you look down on it, it spells Austin. And somebody asked me about, well, where's, where's the drawings for this design? And I showed him this little napkin, and Grandpa had drawn Austin on this, on this napkin. And the A starts down there, and the N stop, stops down here. So really, it's shaped. That's the design right there. And, and, you know, like where the rocks are, I think I tell a story about this was kind of built in this Zen philosophy. Grandpa would get his crowbar, and he'd be up on that hill, and he'd be lifting on this rock by itself. And wherever it rolled down and landed, that's where it's supposed to be. <laughs> okay. so, so I don't know a lot, Jenny, about the real details as how large it is and all that. But, um, yeah, that's kind of how it started. Well, no, because of, <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it, it, if, the tree, if the trees were all gone, okay. Okay, that, that, <laughs> that was the intent. That was the intent. Uh -huh. Let's do a little bit more of a history lesson with your grandfather when he was in Brentwood, right? And then when uh -huh. he was interned, talk to, about, talk to us about his time uh, during the war. Uh, you mean while he was in camp? So before that. In Oh, 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 before that. Okay, very, it's a very interesting story because, you know, because of what's going on these days and all this, this so, kind of this injustice. Well, you've heard that FDR, if, if, if it wasn't for Pearl Harbor, they were actually looking for ways to get rid of the Japanese American farmers on the West Coast because they were actually doing better than the white. They were threatening the, the financial, the economics of the white farmers. Similar to when the Vietnamese shrimpers came to Texas, you know, 
people were shooting at them, the white shrimpers were shooting at them because they were working harder and they were doing better. So that was going on on the West Coast at that time before Pearl Harbor. Well, Pearl Harbor was the perfect out for FDR to put all these Japanese American farmers, and most of them were farmers. Most of them were agricultural related from the West Coast into the internment camps. And I can't remember what that total number was. But so what happened was grandpa was, um, he was ahead. He, he was pretty bright back then in the days. What he did, he started a cooperative with a lot of the other Japanese farmers in that area, in the Brentwood area. What they would do is they, they would buy their equipment together and they would build their warehouses together and they would share those instead of each person having their own. So economically, you know, that was really cool. And then grandpa was known as the leader, you know, so they would have these meetings. They would have these meetings once a week in one of the sheds, in one of the sheds there. And the, the white uh, farmers around started started reporting them to the FBI saying that they're having these secret meetings to fund the uh, emperor of Japan to raise money and send it to Japan to help them, you know, with their with whatever they were doing, their imperialism at that time. So so they the FBI kept watching, uh, kept kind of spying on them. And for instance, uh, the FBI said that they were, you know, in, farmers, what they do when they're strawberry fields or something, they cover them with canvas and they put these smudge pots, you know, kind of under the canvas. They were saying they were sending smoke signals to the ships that were out in the Pacific, that these Japanese farmers were using those smudge pots to send, send smoke signals to the Navy, the Japanese Navy. The other thing that they said was that they would plant, everybody plants their uh, crops in a row, right? They said that they would plant their crops so that their, the rows would be pointing to some strategic area. I mean, it was just hysteria, you know. So finally one day, uh, my grandparents, my grandfather and uh, his hel helpers, they would all eat together in, in my grandparents' house. And my grandmother would always cook the lunches. And it'd always be Japanese food, you know, whether they were Japanese or not. But So they were sitting there eating lunch and the, somebody, the sheriff of that county broke into their door, they didn't even knock, and they came in with their pistol, pistols drawn, and they said uh, they're gonna take grandpa off. Um, they were eating lunch at that time, and my, my dad was pretty big for, you know, at that relatively large for a Japanese American guy. The one guy that had the gun drawn on him, he, said, he looked at my dad and said, why can't you people use, for, they were using chopsticks, why can't you all eat with forks like normal people do? And my dad looked at him, and this guy was redheaded, raw, fired up, and he, apparently Irish. He says, well, you still eat potatoes, don't you? And, and that really got the guy mad. They gave Grandpa like three hours to get all his stuff together, and they took him to a jail in San Francisco because they had not established the internment camps yet. And the in interesting thing about internment camps that a lot of people don't know is that they all started at racetracks along the west coast of California. And Race, uh, race track, horse race tracks were great because they were already set up. They had the stables, they had the infield, they could put tents up in the infield. So that's the first, the first internment camps were like three uh, horse racing tracks in California. Uh, so they kept grandpa in one of those until they built the Crystal City one. That was built brand new. I mean, FDR uh, built that one. And that's very, it's, it's documented in Jan Jarbo Russell's book, The Train to Crystal City, which I, that's actually about the Taniguchi family in, in, in Crystal City. They changed the characters to make it more interesting. They changed all the men to women. So, so it'd be a more interesting story. But I helped, I helped Jan write that book, and that's when I kind of got involved in this, this social activism time, because the book actually came out just when Trump was elected, and it's so strange that where they put the kids in cages, the Latino kids in cages, is only about five miles from Crystal City, where our family was incarcerated. Oh, no so the irony there is just so, you know, that, that's what got me fired up. I, I do a lot of these things speaking about Japanese Americans and, and how close it is to what we're suffering through today. But that's kind of the history. So then Grandpa went to Crystal City right after you, the horse track. And then the family met him in Crystal City. It was a family camp. Uh, before that, he'd been staying in all these men-only camps, okay? So the family got back together there.